Hey YouTube, it's your History Teacher, Mr. Terry, back again with another History Teacher Reacts video. Today we're going to check out the video that won this week's Patrons Pick Poll. And this was a close one. This one with 51% is as close as it could possibly be. And what our awesome patrons selected this week is Epic History TV's World War I 1914. So... I think this might be the first video I've watched of Epic History TV, but it does sound familiar from the fact that I think people have recommended it to me. And I love World War I, and maybe, I don't know, maybe just people <laughs> knew that I did, and we've kind of been talking about it a lot recently. But anyways, I'm glad this won. I'm excited to check that out. I love learning about World War I. If you guys have known, I repeatedly talk about how I you know, like studying World War I more than probably about any other war, yes, including World War II. Uh, but uh, so, I'm, so I'm excited to check this out. Now, if you would like to be able to get involved in polls, go down to the link to Patreon down below. You can check about uh, check out how that works. And if you'd like to join, you can do that. Now, the original video link is going to be down below. It's important that you go ahead and uh, click that and make sure you get the view, subscription, all that stuff um, over to those guys over at Epic History TV. All right. And with that, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, I'm wondering, since 1914, do they just mean that because that's when the year start or when the war started? Or are they just doing the first year of the war? I guess we'll find out. But that's just my original thoughts there. If I had the helmet with me now, I would wear it. 1914. Okay, July 1914. Okay, so maybe they are starting right with the beginning of the war. That's great. 1914. The great powers of Europe are divided into two rival alliances. The Triple Entente. France, Britain, and Russia. United by fear and suspicion of Germany, Europe's new strongest power. Yep. Uh, yeah, Germany has entered into being an industrial giant uh, at the turn of the century germany had surpassed basically everybody in europe to be the industrial power and starting to be quite uh, aggressive one of the things that seemed to have gone hand in hand with the industrial revolution was imperialism uh, because you need to industrialize you have a, you have a constant need for land specifically for trade for natural resources all those things and germany was starting to get into that game a little bit it's pretty fearsome for the other classical more uh, older empires that you know germany is surrounded by and the triple alliance germany which fears encirclement by its rivals austro-hungary clinging on to a fragile empire and italy seeking gains at french expense well and i think maybe a lot of you might have been thinking wasn't it ottoman empire or something yeah but that is not what the pre-war alliance was like so i'm glad they brought in what it was like before the war and then because when the war actually takes place these alliances will change specifically with this triple alliance or central powers as they're going to be known commonly the spark comes on the 28th of june in the city of Sarajevo. Archduke. Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, is assassinated by a 19-year-old Slav nationalist named Gavrilo Princip. <laughs> Austro-Hungary accuses its Balkan rival Serbia of having aided the assassin and sends an ultimatum demanding humiliating concessions. So I'll look them up sometime. I'm not going to go through them all right now, but in my class, I like to read over the the conditions of the ultimatum and ask my students do you think they are justified and without having the time to go through them go look them up sometime do you think they were justified because basically said you have to accept every single one of these by the way it's like 48 hours they gave them um and and otherwise you're going to have war and you almost think with an ultimatum like that and with a timetable like that that austro-hungary austro uh, austro-hungary wants war but they can make Serbia kind of look like the bad guy by saying, hey, we put out this plan for peace. You're the ones that turned it down. By the way, because uh, this happened so quickly, too, there were indeed people within Serbia and within the government, not necessarily working on maybe official government business, but seem to have aided in the plot um, for the assassination with weapons and stuff like that. So some of those uh, fears were a little bit... Um, justified in the way as, 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 as accusing Serbia of being a part of that. But so Serbia yeah. rejects the ultimatum and Austro-Hungary declares war. Within hours, this is how it Austrian starts, forces right? are shelling Belgrade. The Russian Tsar, Nicholas II, feels honor bound to defend Serbia. 
a fellow Slav nation. Yep. Uh, Russia has always seen itself as kind of like the protector of the Slavs throughout Europe. And also, Russia is looking to, to uh, short, uh, of course, show its strength, especially because in the years preceding this, Russia had lost a humiliating war to the Japanese and was um, had their problems with the Ottoman Empire going back and was uh, maybe in fear of kind of being a laughing stock in Europe, which is not something that Russia had been see, uh, going for really ever since Peter the Great, maybe even, even before that, though. And orders the Russian army to mobilize. German Emperor Wilhelm II has promised his support to Austro-Hungary. He and his generals see conflict with Russia as... It's also important to understand here, though, that Russia mobilized before anybody. And that's why Germany is going to be upset. It's like, God, why are you guys why are you guys mobilizing? You know what I mean? You're going to ruin any peace talks. You're going to ruin anything. Inevitable. And the sooner the better, as Russian strength grows year on year. Russian mobilization is used to justify German mobilization, yeah. followed by a declaration of war on Russia. So one of the things you should really, really look at, and they're e very easy to read, is the letters between Tsar Nicholas, right, king of Russia, and Kaiser Wilhelm, king, if you want to call him, of Germany. And if you know, too, the interesting relationship those two have is they're cousins. And uh, grandmother is basically the, 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 was the Queen of England, uh, making this an interesting uh, family affair. But the letters going back and forth are really interesting because they're really short. But basically what Germany was saying is, hey, you need to, you need to stop this mobilization. And Russia's response was, well, then tell Austria, your buddy, to stop threatening the Serbs. And Germany came back and said, well, we can't get them to stand down while you are mobilizing. And then it became this catch-22. It's like, well, you do it. No, you do it. You do it. And they basically did that for about a week. And by the end, we're just like, all right, I guess I guess that's it then. It's, it's declaration of war for each other. Germany yeah. knows war with Russia means war with Russia's ally, France. It has developed the Schlieffen plan to meet this threat of a war on two fronts. Good. Hope they go into it. First, its armies will advance rapidly through neutral Belgium to encircle and destroy French armies near Paris and win a quick victory. And pretty for, for a pretty simple reason. Uh, they believe that going through to the northern France, specifically Paris, is going to be easier going through Belgium um, than through the German-French border, which is going to be more defended and more prepared. Um, one big problem, though, of course, and though I'm sure they'll get to this, though, is Belgium is a neutral nation. So invading them could look very bad on a political and diplomatic standpoint. Plus, Britain is their buddies, and that could upset them. Then its forces can move east to deal with Russia, yep. whose huge army will take much longer to mobilize. Yep. So you see how that is? You're going to have to fight it. There's a two-front war, and to eliminate that, you're going to need to take out the nation that's going to be ready first, right? So take France out, and to do that, go through Belgium. That's the quickest way to do it. And then hopefully do that by the time the Russians mobilize. Then you don't have a full two-front war. Of course, it doesn't work out that way because Russia is going to mobilize way quicker than they thought. And so Germany declares war on France. Six million men are now marching to war across Europe. That's one reason why Germany will get a lot of blame from people is they were the ones uh, declaring war. Like Russia was mobilizing without really like declaring war in a way. They were kind of, you know, it, it kind of maybe it seemed like that, but... They weren't declaring a war on a nation that wasn't involved. Germany did these preemptive declarations of war, like, you know, before they actually did anything. Germany with France, because Germany declared war, or sorry, Germany declared war on Russia, and also Germany declared war on France before those nations had uh, declared war on them. So that made it maybe in, 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 in a, in a um, more present, like looking backwards in hindsight make Germany look more aggressive that way. But all of them can be justified at least somewhat in some type of thing. I'm not going to say who's the most to blame in this war, because if you try to do that, you're probably going to be wrong. It's one of the things I love about studying World War One is it's very unclear. Everybody has, it seems like, blame, and everybody did things in certain ways. And that's why it's harder to study, I think, World War One than World War Two, which is very cut and dry about why it happened and stuff like that. Italy, however, remains neutral. The terms of the Triple Alliance were supposed to be, though, right? To join an offensive war, the United States also declares its neutrality. 
President Wilson and the American public have no desire to get entangled in Europe's war. That goes back to like things like Monroe Doctrine and just the stuff where USA basically told the like Europe and everyone else in the Eastern Hemisphere, stay out of the West. Okay, Western Hemisphere, that belongs to America. You stay out of business, we'll stay out of your business. So I'd bend the policy and the policy that Americans wanted. It would have been very unpopular um, as this war started breaking out for Americans to want to join the war. So I'm sure they'll talk about it later. Or if they're just talking about 1914, you're not going to get the war declaration um, right then. But back to Italy, it kind of almost seemed to me like Italy, although, yeah, they technically had on this paper this deal with, with like, uh, um, an alliance with uh, Germany, Austria, Hungary, but it's like it's like they weren't committed to that that much. They were still looking out for themselves. I almost get the feeling that they were kind of waiting to see who could give them the best deal, who could get the more most out of, and probably who do they think probably has a better chance. Britain is France's ally, but at first it's not clear if it will join yep. the war against Germany. That's an important thing to know. But when German troops invade Belgium, whose neutrality Britain has guaranteed, an ultimatum is sent from London to Berlin, Get out. demanding they withdraw. It's this was, and Germany knew that thing. You know how they're saying that Britain was pledged to France, but not enough to necessarily immediately declare war. But the it was one of the gambles, right? Germany has made two gambles thus far. One was that Russia would take a long time to mobilize, which would happen way fast, faster than they thought. And they failed on that one. That, that, that gamble didn't go their way. Another one was this. They were kind of almost betting that Britain would care enough about Germany invading Belgium to join the war. They weren't, I don't think, fully convinced of that yet. So they're kind of rolling the dice on that, right? And they're rolling the dice there. That's another dice fail. Did not work. It's ignored. Because it does get Britain, Britain involved. declares war. The guns of August. Here we go. Fighting begins, really. A British expeditionary force lands in France. While the German invasion is held up for crucial days by Belgian resistance at the fortress city of Liège. Very good job by Belgium under the circumstances. massacres against Belgian civilians. The atrocities are inflated by Allied propaganda yep. and help turn public opinion in neutral countries against Germany. This was a PR nightmare for the Germans, um, even again in places like America that didn't necessarily want to get involved in the war, saw what Germany was doing in Belgium that really made them the a, a bad guy in this thing. Kind of, you know, it's like America's not going to play the game, but they're definitely going to root against Germany. Uh, when they saw something like this happening. And the propaganda, propaganda machine was in full swing. This war is so full of it, and it was so successful. One more thing I'll add to this before we get back is propaganda, the, the way that propaganda was in World War One, and how big it was, was realized after World War One. There was a lot of things that were totally blown up, right? Now, where this becomes important historically is when World War II happens. When World War II happens... You hear all these stories, right, of, of you know, grumblings and kind of the underground of, of um, the atrocities that maybe the Germans were doing or the Japanese or something like that. And a lot of people just kind of waved it off saying it's just propaganda. It's fake. It's, it's you know, that kind of thing. And it's kind of like a crying wolf thing. Um, you know, propaganda been around so long, but people were starting to figure out that these were maybe not accurate. And unfortunately, that may have been a reason why some of these atrocities of World War II didn't get identified and taken seriously enough because of the amount of propaganda in World War I that was very misleading. France, unaware of Germany's great encircling attack, launches Plan 17, an offensive into German territory. But in the Battle of the Frontiers, they're driven back with enormous losses on both sides. Stalemate time. The British look at those. We had never seen... Look at these casualties here. What made this war, again, so crazy compared to other wars is we had never seen this type of casualties, especially casualties in these numbers where basically no advantage was gained, right? Where you have these hundreds of thousands of deaths happening 
with very little movement or any success happening. And that's going to be the defining feature of this war, specifically on the Western Front, is people dying by the millions with nothing to show for it. Force that's a, that's a new the thing. Army at Mons. But the British are heavily outnumbered and soon join the French in retreat. Getting the close Allies to Paris. The make their stand at the River Marne, 40 miles outside Paris. Their desperate counterattack saves the city and drives the Germans back. See, the, the, the Marne has to be a victory. It has to be a victory for the British and the French. They cannot afford to lose this. The Marne River is basically the last natural barrier defending Paris, just a few miles outside, okay, a dozen miles outside of, of Paris. If you lose that, it's pretty much, I think, just, you, you're, it's just, you, it's basically nothing stopping you to getting to Paris. And we know if Paris falls, I mean, that's, that might be it, you know what I mean? So they can't lose that. And I guess by losing, though, they can't lose. And it's, it's like they don't necessarily have to win, they just can't lose. You can't lose the ground. And we see that with the immense amount of soldiers and people that died from the British and French side, how bad it's going to be, because they literally cannot afford to lose this position, even if it means a lot of times there's no tactical retreat here that does you any good. Both sides suffer a quarter of a million casualties. The race to the sea begins hmm. as both sides try to outflank, outflank each other yeah. to the north. A series of leads to out. the first battle of Ypres, where the Allies desperately cling on and prevent a German breakthrough. There are more heavy losses on both sides. Look at this. We are. I mean, look at how many are done. There's look like over a million, pretty much, and we're in like like month three. Okay, you got August, September, and now we're in October. This many deaths, right? And you've seen them. They did that, and there was like a quarter million in those last two on each side. All for not much when it comes to anything to show for it and any strategic positioning. This is so crazy. And I don't know if they're going to get into like war technologies, but you guys know that in World War One there was new devastating wars that really got shown off. Things like machine guns, for example, which just really, really halted the, uh, the ability to make strong pushes. The two armies then dig in along the entire 350 mile front, seeking shelter from deadly machine gun fire and artillery shells. Trench warfare has Sucks. begun. Sucks. This is not what people were expecting. War had always been, through basically all of human history, it had been like. Really just, I mean, I'm trying to make this more profound sounding, but had really been seen as like war was about these glorious cavalry or infantry charges, right? That's what you did. Now, trenches were not new, but like tr trench warfare. But all it was was you'd, you'd get in your trench and then at some point you do a coordinated rush on cavalry or whatever. And it was this glorious triumph. And what it usually, you know, often happened in these wars was so many numbers would, would, would go through. And then the, the, the enemy would, would retreat, right? And it was this glorious, prideful thing. But you can't do that in 1914. Why? Because there's this new thing called a machine gun that is out there and will mow you down completely. So you have nothing to do but just sit there. And when you're through your ancestry, you, you were taught about your, your ancestors, whatever, whatever country you're from, about those glorious charges and the glory of warfare and all that kind of stuff. And these soldiers didn't see that. There was no glory and pride in, I forget where the quote or whatever came from, um, was basically there was no glory or pride in sitting in a trench waiting to get blown up, which is exactly what you were doing, which is sitting there waiting to get blown up, right? This will not be the war to end all wars, like it said, but it will be the war to change all wars because war will not be seen in that classical sense anymore. Naval powers all over now. British warships win the first naval battle of the war at Heligoland Bight, sinking three German cruisers. Britain has the most powerful navy in the world, 29 modern battleships to Germany's 19. 
That's thing. impressive, though, from the German thing, because the Germans were not as much of a naval power until very recently. The British have been a naval power their whole existence. So Germany coming on to what they did is uh, an industrial and military feat. Now impose a naval blockade on Germany, preventing contraband goods, including food, from reaching it by sea. The aim is to bring Germany's economy to its knees and force it to surrender. Well, they're, they're also both trying to do that. Germans are going to try to do that with U-boats too, cut them off, which is where you get you know, interactions with the Americans who are trying to do business and then their merchant ships would be attacked. But a week later, the British cruiser HMS Pathfinder becomes the first victim in history of a lethal new weapon. The submarine launched torpedo. The U-boat submarine is an ingenious decision for the Germans to innovate. Because you can't beat the British above water, like if that makes sense. You can't. They're, they're the best. They've got the most. You have to find another way. You can't just go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the British Navy with classical battleship warfare. And developing that technology to be able to go undersea and then be able to do sneak attacks when you, re, uh, um, when you uh, emerge is really ingenious thing, I think, that the Germans did. I, I, it was a brilliant way to make the the war on the, in, in the ocean competitive when it otherwise probably would not have been. German submarines, or U-boats, have a surface range of 9,000 miles and can attack undetected from beneath the waves. And are very they dangerous to be a crew a deadly new challenge to Britain's You do not want to be in a World War One submarine. <laughs> Eastern Front, the long forgotten part of the war. On the Eastern Front, Russian armies invade East Prussia. But they blunder into disaster at the Battle of Tannenberg, where General von Hindenburg and his chief of staff, Erich Ludendorff, mastermind a brilliant German victory, taking 90,000 prisoners and destroying an entire Russian army. That is a lot of prisoners. 90,000 prisoners. I mean, that just shows you how big of the force was. Right, to be able to have that, that's incredible. And to surrender with that many amount of troops must have been really intimidating for the Russians to be able to do that. Or to, to The Russians do that. contribute to their own defeat by transmitting uncoded wireless messages. Can't do that anymore. A second massive Everybody's using German the same victory tech. at Masurian Lakes forces the Russians into retreat. In just six weeks, the Russian army suffers nearly a third of a million casualties. Not going well. Meanwhile, Austro-Hungary's invasion of Serbia suffers a humiliating reverse at the Battle of Tsar. People often forget how good the Serbs were. For being a small little nation, holy cow, they could fight. Austro-Hungary's offensive against Russia also ends in disaster and retreat, with the loss of more than 300,000 men. The fortress town of Chemischul is cut off and besieged by the Russians. The Germans are forced to come to the rescue, launching a diversionary attack towards Warsaw. It leads to weeks of brutal winter fighting around the Polish city of Łódź, but there is no clear winner. More stalemates, huh? The Turkish Ottoman Empire has joined the Central Powers, declaring war on its old enemy, Russia. Yeah, they've been fighting Russia forever. Um, it can go generations back when the Russians were kind of goes back to when the Russians were trying to invade and take area on the Black Sea. Um, go back to like Peter the Great and Catherine the Great, who wanted Russia to be more like a westernized power, meaning like Western Europe and a big key feature of Western European nations is warm water ports. And Russia didn't have anything like that uh, because they were just, you know, back over here. They hadn't extended all the way over here like they are at this time. So they had been fighting. This was Ottoman territory forever. So they've been fighting them forever. And but there you go. But this is such a big bonus for the central powers, Germany, and Austria, Hungary, to be able to have this control down here in kind of the Middle East, but specifically throughout uh, the Bosphorus, the, the strait that's going to connect the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. And why is that? Is because one of the downsides to the Triple Entente geographically, so I'm talking Britain, France, and Russia, is the fact that they're spread out, right? Britain and France are not uh, very close to Russia. They're very, very far away. And to be able to communicate, to be able to resupply and team up 
is virtually impossible because you can't, I mean, there's fighting going on in the north. You can't, the British and the French can't go in the north here because the Germans are going to control this territory. And otherwise, you could go through the south. The British and the French could go around through, uh, through Gibraltar. The British could go around through Gibraltar. France could just go south around the coast of Italy and be able to go through the Strait of Water right here that connects, you know, where Constantinople or Istanbul <laughs> is, uh, that connects that and you could resupply the Russians. Um, so Ottoman Empire being able to come in here and control this is such a big thing. It helps Germany and Austria hungry more than anybody. Um, now you are going to see later in the war attempts to try to take the Strait of, uh, Strait of Water with uh, the Battle of Gallipoli, but I'll let them deal with that as far as the details go, but that will be a massive failure on the Allied part as they were unable to take it. All right, let's keep going. This is great stuff. And yeah, it does look like it's just the first year, huh? Turkish warships bombard the Russian ports of Odessa and Sevastopol. While in the Caucasus, Russian troops cross the Turkish frontier. Expanding the war now. Beyond Europe, the war rages on the world's oceans and in far-flung European colonies. Get your colonies involved. German troops cross into British East Africa, modern Kenya, and occupy Tavata. So you can see the Germans have kind of begun, or were already in kind of the imperial race too. They didn't have maybe as many of the possessions as say like the British or the French had, but you can see an attempt at that. And that's again why you call this a world war is utilizing your uh, utilizing your colonies. All the nations would you know recruit from their colonies, um, draft people in from their colonies, but you also see colonies against colonies put it uh, put against each other. So that's why you see this, right? You see in Africa they're fighting each other while Allied forces seize the German colony of Togoland, modern Togo. But British forces invading German Cameroon are defeated at Garoa and Nsangakong. While a 3,000 strong force attacking German Southwest Africa, modern Namibia, is captured at Sanfontaine. A month later, British landings at Tanga end in chaos and defeat at the hands of a much smaller German force, led by Colonel von Lettoff Vorbeck. Cut off from Germany, Lettoff Vorbeck goes on to wage a highly successful guerrilla war against the Allies, tying down huge numbers of troops. I haven't heard much about this, this campaign. In That's Asia, Japan honors its treaty with Britain and declares war on Germany. It also is convenient for Japan to enter this, that a bunch of these islands just south of Japan were things the Japanese had an eye on because the Japanese are an imperial power at this time, but are controlled by Germany. And just kind of a coincidence there, right? Japanese forces go on to seize the German naval base at Tsingtao. The German colonies of Samoa and New Guinea surrender to troops from New Zealand and Australia. But in the Pacific, off the coast of Chile, German Admiral von Spee's powerful East Asia squadron sinks two British cruisers at the Battle of Coronel. Both ships are lost with all hands. I did not know much about what was going on in this war with um, in, in in South America. So this is this is neat. the Germans, man, really really extending themselves. He runs into a British naval task force in the Falklands. The Falkland Islands. Four Very important to the British. German cruisers are sunk. Von Spee goes down with his flagship. Meanwhile, in the Middle East, British troops seize control of the Ottoman port of Basra, securing access to the vital Persian oil that fuels the British fleet. War of resources. Every modern war is. Every modern war is a fight for resources as well. Mechanized warfare will do that. That winter. Austrian troops finally capture Belgrade. And this is all in 1914. Half a year. Serbs then counterattack and drive them back once more. The fighting in Serbia has already cost around 200,000 casualties on each side. In the North Sea, German warships mount a hit and run raid against English coastal towns, shelling Hartlepool, Whitby, and Scarborough, and killing more than a hundred civilians. You're very intimidating. 
On the Western Front, the French launched their first major offensive against the German lines. But the First Battle of Champagne leads to small gains at a cost of 90,000 casualties. While in the Caucasus, an Ottoman offensive through the mountains in midwinter ends in disaster at Sarikamish. Turkish casualties total 60,000, many frozen to death. On the Western Front, I would say that I first know. Christmas is marked in some sectors Christmas by a truce. truce and games of football in no man's land. There's a great, uh, uh, there's a couple great videos that are about that. If you don't know about the Christmas truce, where the um, on the uh, on the on the Western Front at a bunch of places, they agreed to not fight, not only not fight, but actually came out and met each other. They traded like cigarettes for wine and like or, you know and stuff like that. And then yeah, there was this famous uh, like football or soccer match that happened there. And it was it was pretty it was pretty charming that that happened. It was sad that was basically the only time that would happen because uh, the war just got more and more devastating over time. But check that out. Um, I have a reaction video on it too if you look it up. The killing zone between the trenches. Is that it? Great narrator, by the way. Charles No, that's great. I love I love his voice. He's he's very good at it. Good dictation. I love that. This was so good. This was so good. This was that. I feel like that nice level intermediary. I think you, you do kind of have to be history fan. I think to get into this kind of detail, but I also don't think it's too much that it could be like it's not yet too much to consume, which can have it, especially for a more casual. Uh, history person um, for probably a like a general history class like mine if you if you watched all of these it might be too much um, I think if you're just maybe like a step higher than that of, of of like interest in history I think this is great because it was it wasn't too overbearing um, which was good there but able to hit some specific kind of key things there so this was great. I, I, I um, was able to actually learn a lot, especially about some of the battles. I had always been always I always start with the big kind of the big key concepts and then try to get a little bit smaller and more narrowed. And I'm still in that process of going from the big overarching stuff into the smaller parts. I try to focus on um, big key turning points and stuff like that. And that can be hard to do in wars. Uh, especially ones this big, so I'm still learning about it uh, for sure. And this was this was uh, very very good. So I appreciate that. If this is something you'd like to see, if they have more of these of more years, I haven't looked to see if they do like the other years. But let me know if that's something you'd like to me to to continue on. It was cool to see again how much detail and how many events actually were going on in the first. This is only remember this is only first half year. This stuff starts July August. Um, for when the, the the fighting is going to take place we're only talking about half a year of events shows you how much detail that is going on um i really like too how i was able to see and hopefully you're able to see some more some more of the international conflicts there was a lot more i learned in here about uh what was going on in africa than is often talked about uh, and but you can see yeah, a lot is happening but there's a lot more to come uh, big time there. So this was great. Thank you to our patrons that voted for this. This was a very narrow victory. Again, it was like 50, it was 51% to 49%. So if you'd like to have a little more influence on what gets on this channel, you can join that up. Uh, pledges, all pledgers get access to the polls. There's other um, levels, but it starts a dollar a month if you want to support the channel that way. Uh, I really appreciate that if you um, if you do end up doing that. Some other ways you can interact with our community. We have a very active Discord community. There's a link down below. You can check that out. Um, also, if you are a gamer, I would definitely uh, invite you to come check out my gaming channel. Um, I post videos over there. I also do Let's Plays. There is a link down below to that, as well as links to some other things as well. So remember, just one more final thing. Check out the original video. The link is down below. Make sure you like, subscribe, view the videos, all of those sorts of things. And with that, I thank you for being here, and we'll see you next time. Bye.